Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After he appeared to his followers in Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish that the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard, it, heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, <clears throat> dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. All right, friends. Well, you will likely remember from last week that we are going uh, throughout the season of Easter through the readings appointed for uh, uh, in the book of Revelation. And last week, we kind of gave just a little bit of an overview of what to expect and a little bit of the structure and the format of how this book has been understood by Christians now for thousands of years and something that we hope will uh, bring some clarity uh, as you guys, God willing, study along with us. And so if you are not currently in the habit of reading the Holy Scriptures on a regular basis or a daily basis, what I want to do is encourage you to follow along in the Revelation. Now today, we just read the entire fifth chapter together, and so if you're behind, you're only behind by just a little bit. Very easy to catch up. And I'll say this as well as a word of encouragement that, look, when you're done with the book of Revelation uh, in the end, at the end of the month, uh, everything is going to seem easy after that. And so it's really terrific, uh, a great way to start. And we encourage you. This book was written uh, to, to people so that they would understand what it is that God was doing. It is not written for the sake of obscurity, but for the sake of clarity. It's written so that we would know what God is up to and that we would see clearly not only our God, but his plans for us. It was written to Christians in a time where they were persecuted and needed encouragement, where they were struggling and suffering. 
And it is just as pertinent and important to us today as it has ever been in the life of the church. And so uh, we continue this week uh, to go uh, through this book and wh where we find ourselves according to the appointed readings is the fifth chapter. Now we told you last time as well that throughout this, uh, throughout this season we're going to be modifying these readings and, I, and I'll tell you why. You know, for today, our reading uh, as appointed in the lectionary started with verse 11 and ended with verse 14. It says, and then, and then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and they are singing, worthy is the lamb to receive power and wealth and wisdom and honor and glory and blessing and so forth. And you're like, wow, that's really great. Uh, but as we've pointed out, the whole story of our lives is not just the story of how great things are. And the whole story of the future of our lives in this world the whole story of God's interaction with us isn't just nothing but happiness nothing but glory now will there be times of that absolutely without question will that ultimately be our end when we abide with Christ for eternity in heaven without a doubt but just as if we were to isolate the best parts of our life today and speak only of them it wouldn't exactly be fair or truthful it would only give a, a certain perspective. The truth is, as we know, that there are ups and downs, good and bad, times that are blessings and times of great difficulty. And so when we uh, approach these scriptures, we, we want to be honest about what they're saying as well, because they tell us just that same truth that we already know, that all people understand, that there's a lot more to this life, a lot more complexity than just good times. A lot more complexity than just bad times as well. And in the richness and complexity of this story, in the richness and complexity of our lives, God comes to meet us and to offer us hope. And that's what he's doing to John. Now to recap very quickly, we'll remember that John is imprisoned on the island of Patmos. He is under house arrest and he is in exile. And so he begins by saying that he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he, the book begins with him in a very finite, very small place, confined and, and considering his, his position. And it is from that place, in the smallest of confines, the smallest of... Uh, uh, the smallest view possible, that he hears a voice behind him and he turns around to encounter the risen Christ who speaks to him. And there in his presence are these golden lampstands, which are uh, symbolic of the seven churches in Asia, that is modern day Turkey, where uh, John is the bishop, he's the overseer, he's like the pastor to the pastors of those churches. And he is ultimately accountable to guide and to bless those people. And it is through the encounter with God's word that he is pulled out of himself and receives a bigger vision, right? He begins to see uh, first those people who are under his charge, those people whom he loves and who he cares about. So as he snaps out of this view of only himself, he is able to see first his people. And the Lord speaks to him in a way that opens up his view of what it is that God is doing as well. And this is important because the next uh, two chapters, uh, chapters two and three, will be uh, these accounts of what Jesus has to say to these seven churches in the province of Asia. And we don't have time to go over them today, but I, I certainly encourage you to go through that. But each of those sections begins with these words, I know your deeds, Jesus speaks to those churches and in doing so talking about the good and the bad that he sees when he looks in the lives of those individual congregations he opens John's view not only to one greater picture of the world but one greater picture of reality because the, the next reality is that the Lord is here and he sees and then when he speaks, by virtue of his speaking truth, comes judgment. And this is the next step of, uh, of what it means to see the purposes and the work of God in the lives of his people. You see, by beginning with those words, I know your deeds, he's going to give an account of 
What's been happening? What's been going on? What is it that, uh, that uh, those people are doing? What things they need to keep up? What things they need to return to? What things they need to re refrain from? Because it's speaking this reality that it isn't just for the purpose of worship, but for the purpose of life itself and of the proper living of it, that God gathers us together as his people. And he calls us into a life that is different than the lives we led apart from him, different from the lives that we tend to choose for ourselves. And so the word of God is continuously working to rein us in so that we might set aside the lives we were called from and walk in the one that we were called into in Jesus. And this word begins to work. And it is from this place that chapter 4 begins by saying, uh, with these words, and then I looked. And this is the watchword, right? Because we talked about that the structure of this book is that John is going to be continuously looking first at the world and then he is going to turn and he's going to see uh, progressively greater and greater revelations of, of Jesus Christ and of the nature of the Godhead. And then he will look again at the world and the world will take on a different character. He'll see it from, in a sense, like if we want to visualize this, a higher elevation, a broader view of what's happening in the world. The world will be bigger and it will be more complex. And so the imagery will be deeper, but also the span of time covered in each of these, these views will grow as well. And it will be forever changed, every encounter through the word of God. Not to show something different, but to see clearer, to see broader, to see deeper. But as he looks, he beholds the throne room of God. And this begins the, uh, the important piece for what we're here going to be discussing in chapter 5. He sees God seated on the throne. And around him, we're going to go through some of this imagery. We don't have the ability to go through all of it. And the truth is, is that some of it is perplexing to me, as I'm sure it would be to anyone. At the same time, some of the imagery is quite simple, and we're going to be able to see that ourselves together. And it's very, very clear. That the throne of God is encircled, it says, by a rainbow, uh, which he says appears uh, as emerald. Now, Here's the thing about rainbows. You know what a rainbow is, right? We all know what a rainbow is. We're hoping to see one before we leave church today, maybe. A rainbow represents what? Hawaii. No? Okay. <laughs> we'll see it if you're with me. No, no, I wouldn't mind seeing that by the end of today either, I'll be honest. But no, a rainbow represents God's judgment, right? Because we remember from the sixth chapter in Genesis that when God came to, uh, to judge the world, his heart was grieved over the, the, the depth of man's sinfulness. And he comes in judgment, but he chooses to save for himself a people, the people who are the descendants of Noah. And in that judgment, he uh, brings deluge, he brings rain, he brings flood, and he brings destruction. And the truth is, is that that paradigm of judgment, that way of thinking about the world, it is important and it's true. And the scriptures don't shy away from it, but so often as Christian people, we do. And this is a, this is a problem. That imagery of this encircling of, of a rainbow is important because at the end of the flood, God, it says, hangs his bow in the sky. If you're reading next year when we do this, not his bow in the sky. He hangs his bow in the sky. This is to say he puts away his weapon. And that is the imagery that God is not going to fight against us, but he is going to, he's going to place this up above. And the imagery of a rainbow is incredible. And I would say maybe more incredible than you would ever imagine could have existed at that time. Because what is a rainbow? Well, a rainbow is light. And in a strange way, it's not, it's not a separate kind of light. It is the same light that fills this room and that, that lights up outside during the day. It is just that light when it is diffracted, when it is broken down into its parts, parts that is so it can be seen completely for what makes it up. It takes on a brilliant, incredible nature where we're able to see for the first time that there is more to light, more to truth, more to God than we could have ever imagined. And that God's weapon is this light. Because he sees that the problem with our humanity is darkness. 
It's the same thing that Jesus tells Nicodemus in chapter 3 in John's gospel. This is the judgment that God has against mankind, that men have loved darkness because their deeds were evil. And this is precisely where evil takes place. Everyone knows that dark is a time to be worried. It's a time uh, and a place where people seek to hide things, and not only the darkness of night, but perhaps there as well, but intellectual darkness, uncertainty, unclarity, through deceit, through deception. Through these things, people work to try to bring about ends that God doesn't approve of. And God has a weapon for this, that which destroys it, which is nothing other than simple light, bringing it to light. And that is what God desires to do. And as a matter of fact, it's impossible to look from wherever your perspective is and to see God apart from him being surrounded by this, be this beautiful and brilliant light, the lens through which we might see all other things. And so it's no coincidence that this is the image there. Because God isn't afraid of speaking about these things. He isn't afraid of speaking about judgment. But as I alluded to, so often we are. And I want to say that this is, has become an incredible problem in our society. And it's an incredible problem within the church as well. That we no longer seem to want to take very seriously God's judgment. We don't like to talk about it because for us Christian people, we see how merciful and gracious God has been to us through Christ. And certainly that's the place to focus. There's no question about that. But Christ, he brings clarity to the nature of God's judgment. He doesn't dispel it and do away with it. And herein lies the problem. That when we deny that Christ will sit on the throne of judgment, that God has a judgment, and a judgment against how we live and how we fall short, we're lost. Our sight is dimmed. We wander in darkness, unable to see. See, the problem in society and in the church, I believe, is this, that it has somehow become in the minds of perhaps well-intentioned people that it would be better to find yourself being more merciful than God has been to us in Jesus. We want to be done with judgment. People out in the world will often say about our faith that like if God were really loving he would just not judge anybody but this isn't true at all you know, the reality of the situation is, is that all of our actions bring consequences and to speak the truth about that is a judgmental word but it's also true and anyone who loves someone else and who sees them wandering into danger wandering into a pit is going to speak up and say don't walk there no parent who allows, uh, uh, allowing their kids to do any number of things detrimental to their health, their safety, their future, their welfare would be considered a good parent because of, of their, their permissiveness. Because there comes a place where once we step beyond the boundaries that are right and true and appropriate, that refusing to guide is not a blessing anymore. It's hateful and it's hurtful. And it doesn't show a concern for the spirit of people, but rather a lack of regard. And people languish for the need of this word of truth that we hear as judgment. It's important to understand this because this fifth chapter begins with some words that, like I say, the good and the bad, we have to own up to and be ready to speak to as Christian people to be able to deal with honestly. The first verse starts this way. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Wait a second. Seven seals? I think I've heard about that. That's not a good thing, is it? There is a scroll. That is to say, there is truth about the future. There is information unknown to us that God is in possession of. And John wants to know it, and we want to know it, right? And in a weird way, that's kind of what everyone thinks we're trying to get into with the revelation. We want to know what's written on that scroll. And John is found in the, in the beginning of this thing weeping because no one is worthy to open up this scroll. 
There isn't going to be an answer unless these things can be opened up. And for this, John uh, laments. And then all of a sudden, someone is seen who is able to open the scroll. Now, I'm going to fast forward to keep this uh, so that you guys understand what happens. You know what happens when those seven seals open up? There's a whole bunch of worship until you get to that seventh seal. Then there's silence in heaven for a half an hour. And then the trumpet of God blows. And then bowls of judgment are poured out upon the earth. And those are not good things. Why then is John weeping? Why does he want to see so bad what's inside of that scroll? And here lies the most important truth. But the one that are reading about judgment, especially about the incredible um, and in many ways frightening details of the judgment that is poured out upon the earth. We forget to look at the thing that caused all that rejoicing. Because John sees that there uh, all of a sudden is one who is worthy. He said, I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered and having seven horns and seven eyes which are the spirit of God sent out into all the earth and he took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne he is worthy and that lamb who was slain is no one other than Jesus himself the son of God given to take away the sin of the world and this piece of imagery it seems so simple that maybe we just gloss over it because of its simplicity But the truth is, is that this is the crux, literally, on which everything else hangs. That Jesus is the one worthy to open the scroll. That the judgment that God is going to bring comes through Jesus Christ. Because you know what? Jesus Christ died on the cross. He became not just the Lamb of God, but the one slain for the forgiveness of sins so that you and I would be set right with God. He came taking the judgment of God against sin which we see which is death upon himself so that you and I would live and God will not allow judgment to come except through that same Christ who is God's way for you and I to escape that judgment to be set free to be free to live because God has made a way for us in Jesus and there will be no judgment but that which comes about through that same Christ and so Christians you have no reason to worry because God has shown you his judgment sin he has destroyed on the cross but his judgment for you is the same one that was given when that bow was first placed in the sky but through water through baptism he has saved you judgment will come You will be forgiven because God will only judge you through Jesus. And Jesus has shown that he loves you, he forgives you, and that you are his. And out of all the imagery so difficult to understand in this book, that one simple view of heaven, may it be the most important to you ever. It is your life and your salvation because it is the image of Jesus Christ so let us pray Lord Heavenly Father we give you thanks that there are so many things difficult to see but we see Jesus clearly he is our Savior he has forgiven us accepted us he has taken our judgment so that Lord we have nothing to fear in your presence for you will send judgment upon this earth to be sure and you will send judgment to each of us You have judged us to be your children whom you love, whom you have set free through the shed blood of the Lamb. Lord, bless us to walk in that life and to see you clearly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.